Today, flight still has the power to mesmerize and fascinate. Millions of us may fly every year in much the same way as one takes a train. Yet moving around in the sky still provides that sense of excitement and anticipation and fear that even Icarus of Greek legend would have known. And despite flight being commonplace, we still marvel at those who are prepared to test its limits, to go that little bit faster, higher, or further. The mastery of flight remains one of mankind's great achievements, and there are few better places to witness this mastery than at an airshow. On the one hand, you can see an aircraft like this Bleria, which flew before the First World War, when flight was still in its infancy. Europe was electrified when Frenchman Louis Blériot became the first man to fly across the English Channel in July 1909. It is controlled by a system of cables which distort the shape of the wing. Needless to say, it is perilously fragile and can only be flown when conditions are just right. At the same show, one may well see the very latest aircraft like this Airbus A340-600. Not only is it the longest passenger aircraft ever to fly, but also it can fly all the way from London to Australia without stopping. It too uses a system of cables to control its progress through the air. But these are cables that carry data to and from a computer, which then sets the aircraft's controls for optimum flight performance. For the many thousands of people watching the spectacle, it's a dramatic reminder of how far the aeroplane has come in only 100 years. There is only one photograph of man's first powered flight. It was taken just after 10.35 on Thursday the 17th of December in 1903. The location is the Kill Devil Sand Dunes at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Orville Wright is at the controls, while his brother Wilbur, who has been running alongside to steady the right wing, has been left behind as the machine gathers speed. The flight will last just 12 seconds, and Orville Wright will have flown some 36 meters, roughly half the length of the Airbus. But it sets in motion the sequence of events and developments that lead us directly to the Airbus. The flyer, as it was called, was the result of centuries of experimentation by many who preceded Wilbur and Orville Wright. But it was the brothers' near obsession with control that marked out their project as the one that was most likely to succeed. They came to understand, through a process of experimentation, the best way of controlling an aeroplane in three dimensions. For example, they came to realize that the best way of getting an aeroplane to turn was to roll it round its longitudinal axis, making the process of turning much easier and faster. But the brothers were so secretive about their achievement that word was slow to spread. And when people did get to hear about it, many remained skeptical. Nowhere was this so apparent than in France, which was the center for aviation in Europe. Here, a motley group of showmen, scientists, engineers, and men with money to burn, each competed for that ultimate accolade, the first man to fly. Long after the Wright brothers had perfected their machines, Europe's foremost aviators were still struggling to defy gravity. But slowly and painfully, they reinvented the aeroplane and followed the Wright brothers into the sky. The most significant of these early European efforts at flight was by Brazilian Alberto Santos Dumont, who had adopted France as his home. In November 1906, his unwieldy machine, christened 14 Bis, flew 722 feet in 21 and a half seconds. It was the first powered flight in Europe, and the achievement electrified the continent. Europe's aviators gamely continued with their experiments as the Wright brothers' achievements gradually became but a distant memory. In France, the Voisin brothers tried any number of ideas, usually at the behest of their customers. Then, in January 1908, 
Henry Farman flew the first officially recorded one kilometer circuit in one minute, 28 seconds, and so won a prize of 50,000 French francs. But it was not until Wilbur Wright finally came to France in 1908 that aviation in Europe received a much needed boost in solving some fundamental problems. The Wrights had developed a system of wing warping as a means of providing lateral control, something that had so far eluded European aviators. During September of 1908, Wilbur Wright performed a number of demonstrations at Le Mans to the southwest of Paris. Thousands flocked to witness his flights, culminating on September the 21st, when he flew for over one and a half hours. Of course, the Wright brothers were hoping to secure orders and licenses for their machines, but Wilbur's flights underlined how far they had gone and how far Europe still had to go. In Britain, American-born showman Samuel F. Cody attempted to raise military interest in his flying machine. By 1908 standards, its 52-foot wingspan was enormous, earning the contraption the nickname Cathedral. But it was in July 1909 that military complacency towards aviation began to change. Two men attempted to fly across the channel. Both had every chance of success, but a quirky twist of fate meant that only one would earn his place in history, Louis Blériot. By European standards, crossing the English Channel was regarded as a significant milestone in flight. In recognition of the challenge, the Daily Mail offered a prize of a thousand pounds for the first person to fly across the Channel in daylight. Two men stepped forward, Hubert Latham and Louis Blériot. Latham was the first to attempt the crossing in an Antoinette monoplane powered by a 25-horsepower engine. Thousands flocked both sides of the channel to watch the attempt. But Latham was barely seven miles out when the engine failed at a thousand feet. He was forced to ditch in the sea and await transportation back to Calais in a Navy escort. Undaunted, he declared his intent to try again in a new aeroplane. Watching from the sidelines on crutches, having burnt a leg in a crash, was Louis Blériot. Blériot had spent all his money and his wife's dowry in the pursuit of aviation. But a last-minute windfall made it possible for him to mount his own challenge in an aircraft of his own design, the Blériot 11. On Sunday, July the 25th, Blériot judged the conditions to be just right. As dawn lit the sky, he took off from the shore near Calais while Latham slept. 37 minutes later, Blériot landed in a grassy hollow by Dover Castle. It was only then that people began to realize how close he had been to failure. He had been within sight of the White Cliffs of Dover when gusts began pushing his frail aircraft northwards. For 10 minutes, he was totally lost until he spotted three ships heading towards what he assumed to be the port of Dover. Then he spotted the French flag being waved at the spot he had chosen to land. Swirling gusts made his landing a hard one, and although the aircraft was damaged, Blériot was unhurt and ready to take his place in history. Today, there are few examples of aircraft representing this pioneering era still flying. Even faithful replicas are very fragile and tricky to fly. The Shuttleworth collection at Old Warden Airfield, just to the north of London, has several fine examples of aircraft from the pre-First World War era. One example, the Blériot 11, is the oldest flying aircraft in the world. Given its provenance, it rarely flies, and then only as a series of hops along the airfield runway. 
Blériot's flight may have lasted only 37 minutes, but it was seen as an epic achievement and one that captured the imagination of an adoring public. To the Wright brothers, crossing the channel meant nothing. They had flown many times that distance already. But arguably, they were damaging their cause by underestimating its significance in European eyes and the enthusiasm generated by the attendant publicity. The sense of euphoria continued when four weeks later, the cream of Europe's pioneers met for the world's first flying competition at Reims. The only representative from the United States was Glenn Curtis, who, although unknown in Europe, had carved out a formidable reputation as an engine builder in his home country. High society flocked to the airfield outside Reims to watch flyers compete for prizes in altitude, distance, even passenger carrying. But the most prestigious event was to be the competition for the International Aviation Cup or the Gordon Bennett Trophy, as it became more popularly known. Glenn Curtis won the competition by a mere six seconds over Louis Blériot. By proving their machines in competition, the aviators had shown how far flying had traveled in the six years since Kitty Hawk. In the years that followed, more and more events would force the pace of development. First, the challenges of distance and altitude were overcome as more and more of Europe's natural obstacles and boundaries were crossed by aviators. At the same time, the performance envelope of aircraft was pushed ever outwards. In September 1913, Frenchman Adolphe Fugou astounded the aviation world by flying upside down for 500 yards and then righting his machine. This was followed by his demonstration of the first inside loop, something that was, until then, considered more than the human body could stand. Beyond his obvious showmanship was a desire to explore the limits of what man and machine could do. Earlier that year, he had worked with Louis Blériot on a hook and cable system for landing planes on a ship at sea. He then became the first pilot to parachute from an aircraft. Having successfully landed, he watched as his plane continued to fly before plunging into the ground. By now, it was 1913 and Europe was plunging recklessly towards war, a war in which aviation would come of age. Many countries were now making up for lost time, none more so than Great Britain. Among the foremost designers was Aliad Verdon Rowe, who had begun studying flight by watching seabirds on the wing. One of his earliest creations was a triplane, which was one of the first to use small, movable surfaces called ailerons. These provided better control than the wing warping of its contemporaries and would become standard on aircraft for the next 90 years. In 1913, he designed one of the most successful aircraft of all time, the Avro 504. Thousands were built, and later models were still flying well into the 1930s. A great many people experienced flight for the first time in an Avro 504. In 1913, 504s equipped Britain's two fledgling armed air services, the Royal Flying Corps, the RFC, and the Royal Naval Air Service, or RNAS. The original intention had been to have a single air service, but the Admiralty was determined to retain control over all matters it regarded as naval. Aware that aerial reconnaissance could improve the effectiveness of its ships, it began referring to the naval wing as the Royal Naval Air Service, 
and operating as a completely separate entity to the Royal Flying Corps. By now, war in Europe was inevitable. Britain was determined to make up for lost time and a concerted effort was made to train new airmen. Compared with today, the training was extremely basic as the aircraft's controls were rudimentary and there was little in the way of theory to pass on. It was more a case of if the trainee pilot landed the airplane in one piece, then he was qualified. By the eve of the First World War in the summer of 1914, the Royal Flying Corps had 63 aircraft, 146 officers and 1,097 other ranks with which to support the army. The Royal Naval Air Service had 50 aeroplanes, 130 officers and 700 other ranks. Its responsibility was the defense of Britain and its coastal waters. Tensions in Europe reached breaking point on June the 28th, 1914. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated in Sarajevo. It was the catalyst that sent Europe rushing headlong into war. Across Europe, threats were met with counter-threats as the alliances that had provided some sort of deterrence collided head-on. Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire on one side, Britain, France and Russia on the other. The final straw came on the 4th of August. Germany invaded Belgium, whose neutrality was supposed to have been guaranteed in a treaty signed by Britain, France and Germany. Germany's Kaiser dismissed the treaty as a mere scrap of paper, plunging Europe into one of the bloodiest wars in history. A war that would cost its participants dearly and blight the world long after peace had been declared four years later. Germany's military plan was to use highly mobile forces to mount a lightning attack on France through Belgium, where defences were weakest. With France defeated, the German army could then board trains and quickly move to the east to attack Russia. The German plan nearly worked. By the beginning of September, the German army was in the Marne region to the north of Paris. It looked as if the capital might fall. The French, determined to save Paris, threw everything they had in defence. Able-bodied men of all ages drove to the front in taxis, only to be slaughtered in thousands. But their will to resist and the timely arrival of British reinforcements meant that the line held. For the moment, the German advance was halted in its tracks. Then an RFC crew of BE-2 biplane observed sections of the German army changing the direction of their advance in order to strike at the flank of the French. British forces were rushed to block the move. It was a decisive moment in the evolution of air power. Before the war, military planners had had no clear vision of how the aeroplane might be useful for war. Now it was clear that aircraft were going to be very useful in reconnaissance roles. Reconnaissance flights were also extremely useful to the artillery, who began relying on pilots' reports to adjust the fall of their shells. In fact, aircraft proved so useful in the reconnaissance role that new aircraft like the Vickers gun bus were specially designed for the purpose. They were known as pushers because the engine was mounted behind the pilot. This gave the observer seated in the front a clear field of view of the battlefield below. The rapid progress in wireless telegraphy meant that information could be passed back to the artillery batteries without the need to land. But the war on the ground was going nowhere and at sea the mighty fleets of both sides remained safely in their ports as they were too valuable to risk in open waters. To the troops on the ground enveloped in mud and cold, the war in the air must have seemed like some wonderful adventure compared to the grind and misery of trench warfare. The truth was rather different. Aircraft were proving so useful at observation that airmen started shooting at each other. Soon, New aircraft equipped with machine guns appeared for the sole purpose of shooting down other aircraft. Air power had now a new and more deadly purpose, control of the sky. The Germans made the first major breakthrough with the Fokker Eindecker 
which appeared over the Western Front in July 1915. Its machine guns were synchronized with the engine so that they could fire through the propeller. The pilot simply had to point his aircraft at his opponent in order to fire accurately. The Fokker's other unique feature was its flying tail, in which the entire surface of the tail moves. Although all modern fighters have flying tails, it took nearly 30 years before such a feature appeared again, this time on the German-built Messerschmitt Me-262. British pilots were helpless in the face of what they called the Fokker Scourge. But design and manufacture of new aircraft was better organized so that new, more advanced aircraft began to arrive in the front lines. One of the first aircraft to emerge was the SE-5A in April 1917. It was one of the first British aircraft built specifically as a fighter, a role it performed with great success. It was extremely rugged and powerful, nearly twice as fast as the aircraft which had equipped the RFC in 1914. It also made a steady gun platform, armed with a synchronized Vickers machine gun, as well as a Lewis gun mounted on the top wing. The SE-5A proved to be more than a match for most German aircraft, and gradually the Allies gained superiority in the skies over the Western Front. The SE-5A was joined in the front line by the Sopwith triplane. Its short wings enabled it to turn much more quickly, as well as providing it with an extraordinary rate of climb. Nearly all of the 150 or so triplanes built went to the RNAS squadrons in France, where they achieved great success. One unit, B-Flight of Number 10 Squadron, accounted for at least 87 enemy aircraft between May and July 1917. Not surprisingly, German pilots were so alarmed by this aircraft that they demanded one of their own. The result was the legendary Fokker triplane, which proved deadly against slower reconnaissance machines. By July 1917, a new fighter was arriving in numbers, which was arguably the best fighter produced by any country during the war, the Sopwith Camel. It was called the Camel because of the hump created by the housing for the machine guns. Although in inexperienced hands it was difficult to fly, the Camel was a very capable fighting machine on account of its excellent maneuverability. Pilots flying camels claimed more than 3,000 combat kills, more than any other Allied fighter. Although manuals on aerial combat began to appear, pilots learned by bitter experience that the most important tactic in air combat was to get as high as possible, preferably with the sun behind you, and get on your opponent's tail. Twisting and turning, the pilots performed their deadly ballet day after day. To the public at home, the pilots were knights of the air, heroes locked in noble combat, man against man. The reality was far removed from such gentlemanly aspirations. Air combat became known as dogfighting because that is what it was like, vicious and chaotic. The skies would be filled with whirling machines one minute and the next, clear blue skies. There were no parachutes, so if the losing pilot wasn't killed outright, he faced a long plummet earthwards, probably in a machine that was burning around him. Life expectancy for frontline pilots averaged a few weeks. But this is not what the public and politicians wanted to hear. The accomplishments of the aviators were the one bright spot in an otherwise bleak war. Legends were created on both sides, 
Pilots with more than five kills were called aces. They became household names. Ball, McCutton, Bishop, and the most successful British ace, Mick Manock. But the most famous and respected ace of them all was the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen. But neither he nor Manock survived the war. Both were shot down by ground fire in 1918. But there was another side to the air war that was far from glamorous or, in the eyes of the public, heroic. Large bombers meant that cities hundreds of miles behind the front lines could be attacked. Britain had already had a foretaste of this kind of warfare when Zeppelin airships had attacked London and other British cities in December 1914, sometimes at night. The sense of public shock and outrage was all too predictable, for Britain had no aircraft available for home defence. It was the need for coordinated defence against attack that led to the formation of Britain's Royal Air Force on April 1st, 1918, the world's first independent armed air service. By then, it had become the largest and best equipped air force in the world. There were over 27,000 officers and more than 260,000 personnel. The RAF had 3,300 aircraft, equipping almost 150 operational squadrons. Several types, like the Bristol Fighter, were among the best aircraft designed during this era. What's more, the majority of the aircraft had been produced by British manufacturers, mostly through private enterprise. The pace of innovation had been extraordinary. Aircraft could now fly twice as high and fast as they could at the outbreak of war. Engines had also become much more reliable and efficient. It was also possible to build some very large aircraft, like the Vickers Vimy, and carry the war to the enemy's cities. The Vimy carried a crew of four and just over 1,100 kilos of bombs. The two Rolls-Royce Eagle engines gave it an endurance of 11 hours. Bombers like these would provide the backbone of the RAF's heavy bomber force until the early 1930s. And following the end of the war in 1918, they would help pioneer new civilian roles, transporting passengers and freight around the world. In the 15 years that separated Kitty Hawk and the end of the First World War, the aeroplane had become an essential weapon of war. The critical roles of air combat, bombing, reconnaissance and transport had all been tried and refined to the point that military commanders would, from now on, have to make control of the skies a central objective in wars of the future. Following the end of hostilities in 1918, there was a dramatic scaling back of armed forces, the peace dividend, as we call it today. The world had had enough of war. The cost in human terms had been too high. Also, this first war of the industrial age had crippled the economies of many countries. Aircraft were expensive to make, and so development of military aircraft slowed virtually to a halt. Attention now turned to see how aviation could help forge closer bonds around the world. In 1909, the English Channel had been regarded as the first great natural obstacle to be overcome. Now, in 1919, it was the Atlantic Ocean that captured the public imagination. The first transatlantic flight was made on June the 14th, 1919, when two Royal Air Force crew, John Alcock and Arthur Brown, took 16 hours and 28 minutes to fly from Greenland to Ireland in a Vickers Vimy. The aeroplane had joined two continents, but arguably an even greater challenge lay in flying the furthest of them all, Australia. In 1919, it seemed an impossible challenge. Certainly, no aircraft could fly across the Pacific from the west coast of the United States. The alternative was to fly eastwards across Europe, Middle East, and down through Southeast Asia 
It would mean flying over some of the most inhospitable deserts and jungles on Earth. But there were no shortage of takers, especially when the Australian government put up a prize of 10,000 pounds. It was a grim morning on November the 12th, 1919, when a team led by two brothers, Ross and Keith Smith, took off from Hounslow in their VV. The plane's registration, G-E-A-O-U, was interpreted by the crew as meaning, God help all of us, and they would need it. For the flight to succeed, they would need to take enough spares to cover any emergencies, but not too many, as the extra weight would shorten their chances. Inevitably, the flight did not go without incident, including smashing the tail skin on a tree stump, which had been left on a hastily prepared landing ground in Malaya. As it was one item for which there was no spare, one of the engineers, Jim Bennett, had to make a new one. Finally, after 28 days and perilously short of fuel, they arrived in Darwin to a rapturous reception. Nine years later, the same route was followed by Bert Hinkler in an Avro Avian. His solo effort was completed in 15 days, which was as much a testament to Hinkler's stamina as the speed of his fragile biplane. Throughout the years between the wars, the frontiers of flight were pushed back as man sought to fly ever higher, faster, and further. Aircraft were especially built in order to establish new records. One of the most famous of these was the Spirit of St. Louis, in which Charles Lindbergh completed his epic solo flight across the Atlantic in May 1927. As more records were set, so the opportunities for passenger air travel grew. Flying boats were used to fly the long routes as both civilian and military operators recognized that they offered the most practical means of transporting passengers and cargo over large distances. By 1929, the flying boat had reached gargantuan proportions. The Dornier DOX was the largest plane to fly up to that point. The plane was enormous, with a wingspan of over 157 feet a length of over 134 feet and a height of 33 feet. It was so large that passengers were asked to crowd together on one side to help the flying boat make turns. The luxurious accommodation and service on the DOX were in keeping with the standards of transatlantic liners. Several cabins on the main deck held passengers comfortably on 32 double seats and two single seats while the cockpit captain's cabin, navigational office, engine control room, and radio office could be found on the upper deck along with the quarters for the 14-man crew. The lower deck held fuel and stores. At the same time, airlines were created offering scheduled flights. Foreign travel was no longer exclusive to the rich. In 1930, the Handley Page HP-42 began entering service with Imperial Airways, who flew passengers to the furthest corners of the British Empire. At the same time, 
Junkers of Germany were introducing their new passenger aircraft, the Ju-52. But it was as a military transport that the Ju-52, or Tante Ju, as it had become affectionately known, made its mark. At the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, Ju-52s were used to airlift Franco's entire fascist army to Spain from North Africa. It was a decisive moment as the advantage now passed to the fascists. There would be many more occasions in which the Ju-52 would play a vital part, especially when used to transport paratroops. During the 1920s and early 30s, the lack of military orders forced manufacturers to look at other ways of surviving. As a result, leisure and sport flying was given a welcome boost as the manufacturers turned their expertise to making smaller, cheaper aircraft. Some, such as the de Havilland Tiger Moth, were built as trainers for the armed services, but then sold privately to private flyers. Around 8,000 Tiger Moths were built, and a number remain flying to this day. Competitive flying also grew in stature, for which specialist aircraft are required. Elegant monoplanes began appearing, like the Miles Hawk Speed 6. Some of the races spanned continents, such as the McRobertson Air Race to Australia in 1934. The race was run by the specially built de Havilland Comet. In the United States, races such as the Bendix Trophy became important events, attracting huge audiences across the country. But the blue ribboned event of international competition was the Schneider Trophy. In 1931, the competition came to an end when Britain won the trophy outright for the third time in a row. The team of Royal Air Force pilots flew the supermarine-built S-6B at a speed of 407.5 miles an hour, which was also a new world speed record. For some, there was a sobering thought that this speed was substantially faster than the military aircraft of the day. But by the beginning of the 1930s, the rumblings of discontent and conflict were getting louder. In Germany, the Nazis under Adolf Hitler assumed more and more power. Although banned by the Treaty of Versailles, signed in 1919 from having an air force, Germany began training pilots and building aircraft. There were new, fast monoplanes, such as the Messerschmitt Bf 109, which first flew in May 1935. Although the 109 became synonymous with the Battle of Britain, it served on all fronts, including Russia and North Africa. And it is a testament to the aircraft's design that it remained the preferred mount of the Luftwaffe's aces, even when newer designs became available towards the end of the Second World War. As well as being highly maneuverable, the 109 was faster than its contemporaries when it first appeared. It was also more heavily armed with machine guns and cannons. Around 35,000 109s were built, making it the second longest production-run aircraft in history. As well as building new fighters, Germany also embarked on a program of bomber production. The Heinkel 111 was typical of its time. A medium bomber with twin engines, the Heinkel seemed at first to be very effective when it flew in combat during the Spanish Civil War. But attacks by British fighters during the Battle of Britain showed up the Heinkel's lack of defensive armament. Adding more crew and weapons only added to the weight, making the aircraft even slower and thus more vulnerable. 1935 could be regarded as a landmark year in aviation's history, as several other aircraft that were to become significant milestones in the story of flight made their debuts. In March 1935, the consolidated PBY Catalina made its maiden flight. Its durability and range meant that it could stay aloft for 20 to 30 hours at a time. During the Second World War, 
Catalinas were to prove very effective in reconnaissance and air-sea rescue roles. As a result of its usefulness, more Catalinas were built than any other flying boat in history. In July 1935, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress flew for the first time. The Flying Fortress is forever associated with the great aerial armadas of the US 8th Air Force that assaulted Germany from 1942. But the type's first combat experience was in the hands of Britain's Royal Air Force. But the early models were vulnerable to frontal attacks where there was no armament. This was steadily increased, so that by the time the G variant entered service, it bristled with 13 guns. Today, there are many stories told about the B-17, but the plane nearly didn't happen, as the prototype crashed while competing in a fly-off for orders with an aircraft from the Douglas aircraft makers. But it was with a transport aircraft that Douglas made its mark. The DC-3 Dakota first flew in December 1935 and played an important role in opening up civil aviation routes. When war came, the civilian airliners were taken straight off the production line, given wider doors for cargo and painted in camouflage before being sent off to war. The Dakota proved to be incredibly durable. It could operate from the roughest of runways, even when stuffed to the gunnels with supplies or men. As a result, the Dakota was regarded as one of the most important weapons of the war, particularly when the Allies began to go on the offensive. The plane's ability to operate from quickly prepared forward airstrips ensured the frontline troops were quickly resupplied and reinforced to keep the advance moving. In Britain, aircraft development lagged behind that of its European neighbours. But when it became clear that war was inevitable, a programme of bringing the RAF up to date began. During the years between the wars, the bomber was regarded as the ultimate terror weapon. To a certain extent, the RAF had demonstrated the bomber's capabilities by successfully policing the remote regions of the northwest frontier. But pacifying mountain tribesmen and fighting a total war in continental Europe were very different propositions, not immediately recognized by commanders. The emphasis was on boosting fighter defences, and when the Hawker Hurricane first flew in November 1935, it was clear that a new age had dawned. Although the Hurricane was a monoplane, its method of construction was very similar to that used in biplanes, in that it featured a skin stretched over the frame. Although often regarded as less glamorous than the Spitfire, the hurricane was immensely tough. Bullets could pass straight through it, and as long as nothing vital was hit, the plane would always get the pilot home. 
it is the Spitfire which has captured the imagination of generations since it first flew in March 1936. The Spitfire was the result of its designer Reginald Mitchell's experience with the Schneider trophy winning supermarine S6B. Although an aircraft of great beauty, the Spitfire was complicated to build. And yet, although more hurricanes fought in the Battle of Britain, over 20,000 Spitfires were eventually built by the time production ceased in 1947. The earlier aircraft flew with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, but later marks were equipped with the more powerful Griffin engine, also built by Rolls-Royce. Pilots loved the Spitfire with a passion that lasts to this day, describing it as something you wore rather than simply sat in. For the purists, the early marks powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine with its elegant lines and smaller dimensions are considered the definitive Spitfires. There was also limited development of the RAF striking power with the arrival of the Vickers Wellington. Like the Spitfire, the Wellington was a complex structure in that it consisted of a grid assembled using metal rods. The method was called geodetics, which was both very strong but light. The Wellington was to form the backbone of RAF Bomber Command during the first years of the Second World War. At the time, they were the only weapon with which to take the fight to the enemy. There were still many problems to overcome with navigation and bomb aiming, but the very fact that the Wellingtons could reach Germany at night and bomb its cities undermined the Nazis' self-proclaimed invincibility. The outbreak of the Second World War in September 1939 brought with it a new age of air power. Many theories on the meaning and delivery of air power had been argued over during the interwar years. The next six years would provide some definitive answers. The German Blitzkrieg offensive through Europe demonstrated the effectiveness of tactical air power. Close coordination between air force and armor was a lethal combination that easily overcame the poorly equipped forces of Poland, the Low Countries, and finally France. But once it reached the coast of France, the Luftwaffe found it was not so well equipped to fight a strategic air war. The fighters had limited endurance, which restricted the strength of the protective umbrella they were supposed to provide for the bombers. Similarly, the bombers were all medium bombers and therefore had to rely on large formations of aircraft 
in order to inflict significant destructive force. Against them were the highly motivated, highly trained and well-equipped pilots of RAF Fighter Command. Flying from their home airfields, they could fly four, five or even more sorties in a single day, whereas the Luftwaffe could barely manage two. Thus, the RAF was able to multiply the strength of its force. But what really made Britain's defences so effective was the integration of fighter, observer and a new technology called radar. Radar provided basic information about the size and direction of formations as they left the French coast. The Observer Corps provided visual confirmation. All information was passed to a central point where it was analyzed, enabling Fighter Command's commander, Hugh Dowding, to order the right number of fighters into the air to counter the threat. The Luftwaffe opened what would later be known as the Battle of Britain by attacking the fighter airfield and radar stations along Britain's south coast. Waves of bombers would sally forth while swarms of Messerschmitts would loiter overhead waiting for any fighters. The attack would only last a matter of minutes, but in its wake would be great destruction. It was immensely draining on the RAF pilots who day after day had to be ready before dawn and rarely stood down before nightfall. But a few courageous pilots flying superb hurricanes and spitfires couldn't stop the sheer weight of numbers from taking its toll. The airfields could not be repaired quickly enough, which in turn limited the number of aircraft available the RAF was losing the Battle of Britain. Then, just as things were reaching a critical point, events took a dramatic turn. Hitler intervened directly and ordered the Luftwaffe to attack British cities instead. Unpleasant though it was, bombing British cities achieved nothing militarily. It did, however, provide a much-needed breathing space that enabled Fighter Command to recover so that it could attack the Luftwaffe with renewed vigor. The tide of battle now favoured the RAF. Without air supremacy, Germany could not attempt an invasion of Britain. The battle reached its zenith in the first two weeks of September. Wave upon wave of aircraft were sent to attack London. 
but the Luftwaffe's losses were mounting to unacceptable levels. By October, the battle was virtually over, and although the raids continued into the winter of 1940 and 41, the RAF had won the first battle of strategic significance to be fought entirely by aircraft. As the Battle of Britain subsided in the autumn of 1940, a totally new form of air power was launched against the Italian fleet using aircraft carriers. The Royal Navy had recognized the aircraft's offensive potential since the early days of the First World War, when it had launched bombing attacks against the German airship sheds. During the years between the wars, both British and American navies had developed aircraft carriers in the belief that this was the best way of delivering air power over long distances. On November the 8th, 1940, some 20 ferry swordfish biplanes took off from the aircraft carrier Invincible and attacked the pride of the Italian fleet in its harbor at Taranto in southern Italy. Although the swordfish was obsolescent by the outbreak of the Second World War, it proved to be devastatingly effective. Flying at less than 50 feet, the swordfish were able to fly below the arc of the Italians' defensive guns and deliver their torpedoes and bombs. The Italian fleet, once one of the finest in the world, was cut to pieces and never again would pose a serious threat. The potency of the carrier force had been proven and would become even more significant as the war progressed. Also watching and learning from the lesson of Taranto was the Japanese Imperial Navy. On December the 7th, 1941, aircraft flying from Japanese aircraft carriers attacked the United States Pacific Fleet in its base at Pearl Harbor. It was a terrible blow to the Americans' belief that the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans afforded them natural protection from attack. The attack brought the United States into the war, with her enormous industrial capacity turned over to war production. The outcome of the Second World War could never really be in much doubt. It was now a matter of time. The only practical means of fighting the war in the Pacific was to build aircraft carriers. The United States Navy was already flying new aircraft specifically designed to cope with the rigors of carrier operations. The Grumman Wildcat was a typical early example of these tough, powerful aircraft that would prove decisive during the fight back across the Pacific Ocean. Although it could be outmaneuvered by the Japanese Zero, the Wildcat was faster in a dive, had much better protective armor and a greater caliber machine gun that could chop through the flimsy Japanese aircraft. Later in the Pacific campaign, carrier operations were strengthened by the arrival of the Vought Corsair. Initially, the Corsair was a failure due to poor visibility and overly stiff dampers on the landing gear, which induced a vicious bounce on touchdown, not ideal for landing on a pitching carrier deck. But once these problems were resolved, the Corsair became one of the best and fastest fighters in the Allies' arsenal. Indeed, it was so successful that Corsairs were built until 1952, many seeing active service during the Korean War. 
One of the most audacious events in the Carrier War came in April 1942. 16 B-25 Mitchells, led by Jimmy Doolittle, took off from the USS Hornet and bombed Tokyo. The Mitchell was one of the best and most versatile medium bombers of the war, although flying it off an aircraft carrier was stretching its capability beyond belief. Although the attack achieved little militarily, it had enormous propaganda value. The Japanese were forced to accept that their homeland could also be attacked. And even if Doolittle's raiders could be dismissed as irrelevant, there would surely come a day when bigger aircraft carrying bigger bombs would appear in the skies overhead, bringing terrible destruction. Meanwhile, the bombing campaign in Europe during 1942 was beginning to move up a gear as heavy bombers like the Avro Lancaster entered service. The Lancaster was a development of the twin-engined Manchester, but the Manchester's Rolls-Royce Vulture engines were unreliable. So the decision was made to change the power plants to four Merlins. The transformation was immediate, for not only did the Lancaster inherit the Manchester's enormous bomb bay, but it also had excellent performance. Lancasters were able to play a pivotal role throughout the RAF's bombing campaign, beginning with the Thousand Bomber raid on Cologne in May 1942. Even though there were still problems with navigational and bomb aiming accuracy, that the RAF could even get 1,000 bombers into the air at one time sent a powerful message to Germany. And although the bombing campaign ultimately did not directly force Germany's surrender, it caused immense damage to Germany's war production and tied up huge amounts of resources in providing defensive measures. The campaign was given even greater power when the United States Air Force began arriving in Europe in 1942, including the legendary 8th Air Force. By day, B-17s and B-24 Liberators would pound targets from the Baltic to North Africa. But there were some hard lessons to be learned, and initial casualties were high. Spitfires were generally given the task of escorting the bombers, but the Spitfire did not have the range as it was never intended for this role. As a result, the bomber formations had to fly unescorted over enemy territory. Waiting for them were hordes of Messerschmitt 109s, and Fokker-Wolf 190s, some of which were now equipped with crude rockets. One solution was to develop an aircraft that relied on its speed and altitude to put it beyond the enemy's defenses, 
The de Havilland Mosquito was designed specifically for this role, but proved so versatile that it was used in many other forms of combat, including night fighter and reconnaissance. However, new fighters with the range to reach Germany were on their way. The first of these was the P-51 Mustang, which first flew in October 1940. The Mustang was originally designed to meet a specification from the RAF, and although the Allison engine gave good low-level performance, it ran out of puff at high altitude. This problem was solved when the Rolls-Royce Merlin was installed instead. Now the Allies had the best fighter in the world, with the range to take the fight into the enemy's backyard and win. But the piston engine fighter had almost reached the end of its development potential. Fighter pilots were finding their controls locking up when in a dive and almost reaching the speed of sound. The only thing stopping them from going faster was aerodynamics. It had been recognized for years that in theory there was a finite amount of speed that a piston engine fighter could achieve. As far back as 1930, an RAF Flight Lieutenant Frank Whittle had patented a new form of propulsion, the jet engine. But his ideas had seemed too radical at the time, and it wasn't until May 1941 that an aircraft powered by his jet engine flew for the first time. However, the Gloucester E-28 was an experimental aircraft and it was not until July 1944 that the Allies' first operational jet aircraft, the Gloucester Meteor, entered service. The first Meteors were a little faster than the best piston aircraft, and at first commanders were unclear as to how the new jet should be deployed. But when the Germans began attacking London with V-1 flying bombs, the Meteor found a road. It was able to close on the V-1s and either shoot them down or destabilize them by flipping them with their wingtips. Later marks received more powerful engines and the Meteor went on to serve the RAF and other air forces around the world until the 1960s. Had it not been for official reticence and indecision, the RAF could have had an operational jet years before the rest of the world. But the RAF was beaten to it by the Luftwaffe. Two months before the Meteor entered service, the Germans had introduced the world's first operational jet, the Messerschmitt ME-262. However, the ME-262 was plagued by a shortage of quality materials, which limited the numbers that actually made it into service. Also, priority was given to the bomber version, which was not very effective, as it could only carry two small bombs under the wing. But the 262 was significant in other areas. It was the first aircraft to have swept wings. It also had what is called a flying tail and slats on the leading edge. It provided, in effect, the blueprint for jet fighters for generations to come. Nowhere was the German influence more apparent than in the United States. <laughs> 
Many German scientists and engineers were offered fresh starts in American aerospace industries. Their knowledge and experience helped American aircraft manufacturers develop new designs that progressed from the straight-wing F-80 shooting star to the swept-wing F-86 Sabre within two years of the end of the war. The Sabre was undoubtedly the best jet fighter of its generation. As well as swept wings, it featured a flying tail mounted at fuselage. The design was aerodynamically efficient enough to enable the Sabre to fly faster than the speed of sound. In 1950, war erupted in Korea. For the first time, jets were joined in air combat when American Sabres came up against Russian-built MiG-15s. The MiG-15 was, like the Sabre, a single-engine swept-wing fighter and was supplied in great numbers to the Soviet allies. Although the MiG had similar performances, the Sabre usually came out on top due mainly to the greater experience of the US pilots. On August the 6th, 1945, the world entered the nuclear era when a single Boeing B-29 Superfortress dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Without doubt, these two bombs greatly influenced the Japanese decision to surrender and end the Second World War. In just over 40 years since the Wright brothers' first flight, the aeroplane had developed from a machine barely capable of carrying a man for more than a few hundred meters into something that could destroy cities thousands of miles away. Air power was now the dominant strategic weapon. In the decades that followed, the world slipped into the Cold War with the United States and her allies on one side and the communist countries dominated by the Soviet Union on the other. Both had nuclear weapons and were rapidly developing aircraft to deliver them. The first jet bombers of the nuclear era dispensed with defensive armament in favor of speed and altitude. In the United States, the Boeing B-47 became America's first all-jet strategic bomber. Britain's V-Force was created to deliver Britain's nuclear deterrent in the 1950s and 1960s. The most radical of the designs was the Avro Vulcan, which had a huge delta wing. Its four Rolls-Royce engines were able to take the Vulcan to close to the speed of sound and to operate at 60,000 feet. At the same time, in the United States, Boeing revealed the mighty B-52. It was designed to carry the heaviest bombs over intercontinental distances, a task it was more than capable of performing, aided by eight Pratt and Whitney jet engines. The B-52 was so successful and adaptable that it still remains in service long after its contemporaries have been retired. Indeed, it will continue in service well into the 21st century, providing the backbone of the United States Strategic Bomber Force. In 1960, the B-52 was joined in service by the B-58 Hustler. Built by General Dynamics in America, the Hustler was the first truly supersonic bomber, flying at up to three times the speed of sound. At this stage, 
Nuclear bombs were still essentially larger versions of the weapons dropped during the Second World War, in that the bomb had to be dropped more or less directly over the target. But new weapons that could fly themselves to the target were already in development. Blue Steel was developed as Britain's standoff nuclear weapon. Introduced in 1961, Blue Steel was intended as a stopgap measure until the smaller, lighter Skyboat became available. Although Skyboat was a joint project between Britain and America, the Americans decided to abandon the project. Britain was unable to continue the project on its own, and so Blue Steel remained Britain's nuclear deterrent until it was replaced by the submarine-launched Polaris. During the 1950s, altitude was regarded as an aircraft's best means of defense. Designed and operated for the American CIA in great secrecy during the 1950s, the Lockheed U-2 was able to loiter at 60,000 feet. It flew with impunity, conducting surveillance flights over Soviet territory. But in 1960, the Soviets managed to shoot down a U-2. Apart from the loss of this top-secret aircraft, there was the shocking realization that the Russians had developed their surface-to-air missiles and radar systems to such an extent that altitude was no longer a guarantee of safety. As well as ground-to-air missiles, fighters were armed with increasingly more powerful weapons with which to attack bombers. One of the problems shown up during the Korean War was that fighters needed to be more heavily armed. For example, the MiG-15 could fire up to 20, 23 millimeter rounds a second. The Hawker Hunter, which arrived in RAF service just too late for Korea, could fire up to 160 rounds from its four Aden cannon. But even this was not enough to be sure of destroying a bomber carrying nuclear weapons. During the 1950s and 60s, air-to-air -air missiles that could lock on to their target were developed. There were various solutions, including weapons that were guided by radar and those that locked onto the heat generated by the aircraft's jets. The RAF developed an entire defense system around the latter, requiring a new aircraft and missiles. The English Electric Lightning was Britain's first truly supersonic fighter. Its role was to intercept Soviet bombers before they came within range of their targets. By flying at more than twice the speed of sound, reaction times were quicker. Once the bomber had been positively identified, the pilot fired his missiles, which were supposed to destroy a bomber with one hit. The Lightning, like its contemporaries, had limited endurance and carried no other weapons. It was assumed that the age of the dogfight was over. In-flight refueling, however, had been pioneered by the British and so the range and endurance of these one-shot wonders was greatly extended. By the end of the 20th century, aircraft could traverse the globe without having to land, greatly extending the reach of air power. The jet age also heralded a new era in civil aviation. Growth between the wars had been stifled during the Second World War, but aircraft like the Douglas DC-3 had already begun carving out successful scheduled services in the last years before the war. The design introduced new comforts, such as heating and soundproofing in the passenger cabin. During the war, the DC-3 was adapted by the military for use as a transport. Thousands were built and flown in all theaters, after the war, they provided the backbone of the fledgling passenger services that gradually emerged. But experience of designing military aircraft enabled manufacturers to introduce passenger aircraft with longer ranges. 
Aircraft such as the Lockheed Super Constellation played an important role in the introduction of transatlantic services immediately after the war. In Britain, the Vickers Viscount became the first aircraft to use a hybrid jet and piston engine called a turboprop. Demand for air travel was increasing, and in 1952, the world's first jet airliner, the de Havilland Comet, flew its first scheduled service to South Africa. Weeks later, Boeing announced its 707. The age of intercontinental jet travel was born. Jet travel was presented as something to aspire to, particularly as the package holiday was beginning to appear on the high street. The phrase jet set was coined to express the glamour of air travel, a phrase that is still used 50 years on. Today, there is such a demand for air travel, whether it's for business or pleasure, that manufacturers offer a wide choice of aircraft designed for particular routes. Take the Airbus A320, for example. This plane is designed for the short or medium routes. These are the kind of routes that commuters might take across Europe. At the other end of the scale, there is the A340, 5 and 600 series aircraft, which are designed for the ultra-long haul routes. Over 300 passengers can be transported in great comfort over 7,500 miles without stopping. Fifty years ago, when the Comet flew the first jet service to South Africa, such advances must have seemed an impossible dream. But demand for ever cheaper air travel means that faster, more comfortable and larger aircraft will soon fill our skies. The A380, due to enter service in 2006, will be able to carry more passengers than any aircraft before, housed on two decks. Yet despite its size, it will be quieter and more fuel efficient than large aircraft flying today. In 1969, the world's first supersonic airliner, Concorde, flew for the first time. Although a technological masterpiece, Concorde failed to attract customers other than the British Airways and its French partner in the project, Air France. Eventually, the costs of operating Concorde were such 
that it was felt it was time to retire this unique aviation achievement. But perhaps against all expectations, it remained in service for 25 years. Its charisma is such that people still turn their eyes skywards to marvel at this wondrous machine. The boom in air travel has come at a price. Airport capacity has reached saturation point at some of the international hubs. Environmental issues have also had an impact on aircraft design, as well as the need for greater but more efficient performance. The very accessibility of air travel has brought new problems. Managing increasingly crowded skies will be a tough challenge, affecting the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people well into the 21st century. While passenger air travel enjoyed a rapid expansion during the 1960s and 70s, military aircraft are also reaching out to new frontiers. The Vietnam War, which raged throughout the 1960s, underlined the importance of tactical air power and the need for more accurate weapons. The McDonnell Douglas Phantom was to become one of the most potent and versatile combat aircraft ever built. Not only could it fly at twice the speed of sound, it excelled in many different roles from reconnaissance to air combat. It also had a radar that could look down as well as forward, whereas earlier aircraft had radar systems that could only look forward. In an age in which air-to-air -air missiles were taking air combat into new realms beyond the pilot's visual range, such systems were vital. But these aircraft were so loaded with technology that the pilot was in danger of becoming overwhelmed with tasks. Thus, a second crewman was introduced to look after the navigation and weapon systems, leaving the pilot free to fly the plane. The Phantom was used by many air forces around the world, as well as by the US Navy, Air Force and Marine Corps, a measure of the aircraft's versatility. In Britain, the Phantom replaced the Lightning until the RAF's own multi-role combat aircraft, the Tornado, was ready. The Tornado came in two versions, the air defense, and the bomber variants. It was a complex project because it was to be built by three countries, Britain, Germany and Italy. Each had different requirements and the resolution of a design to meet the majority of these in a single airframe was a triumph of collaboration. <laughs> 
But while the RAF was waiting for its tornadoes, a new generation of combat aircraft was taking shape in the United States. The first of these was the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle. The F-15 was designed to outperform, outfly and outfight any opponent it might encounter in the foreseeable future. It was expected to excel and win an engagement extending far beyond the visual range, right down to close-in turning combat. The F-15 was followed into service by the F-16, Fighting Falcon. Originally conceived as a lightweight fighter, the F-16 has become one of the world's most successful aircraft. The air forces of 18 countries, as well as the US Air Force, operate the F-16, and it is expected to remain in service well beyond 2030. The F-15 and its naval counterpart, the F-14, were conceived during the Cold War. In order to counter the challenge, the Soviets began introducing radical new aircraft of their own. The MiG-29 Fulcrum was the first to enter service in 1985. The sharply swept wings and powerful engines gave the MiG-29 exceptional performance. The MiG was joined by the Sukhoi Su-27. Both these aircraft introduced thrust vectoring to the world. By incorporating a movable nozzle on the jet, the thrust can be directed at different angles. The result is an extraordinary maneuverability, which is ideal for its intended role as an air superiority fighter. But the most radical aircraft to come out of this era were based around so-called stealth technology. The F-117 Nighthawk, or stealth fighter, entered service in 1983 and astounded the world with its angular shape. The stealth fighter is one of the most powerful strike aircraft in the world. It is all but invisible to radar systems. The angular sides help deflect radar energy while special paint absorbs what's left. Similarly, it uses special shielding around its two engines to dissipate heat and thus reduce its infrared signature. Although subsonic, the stealth fighter has demonstrated the effectiveness of stealth technology many times. During the Gulf War of 1991, Balkans, Afghanistan, and most recently, Iraq.
But the ultimate embodiment of stealth technology must be the B-2 spirit. Everything that was learned through the operational use of the stealth fighter was incorporated into this strategic bomber. At around 900 million US dollars each, the B-2 is the most expensive warplane ever built, which is why only 21 aircraft were ordered. Flying from their home base in Missouri, USA, the B-2 can traverse the globe carrying up to 16 cruise missiles or 16 nuclear bombs. It's an awesome, if sinister, capability that plays on our most basic fears, that a machine capable of delivering massive destruction can arrive overhead without us even knowing about it. But do such aircraft have a future or have they become just too expensive to risk? In a hundred years, the aeroplane has come a very long way indeed. In spite of its destructive capability, flight has also been a force for good. By bringing countries closer together, we can better understand our fellow human beings on the other side of the world. But perhaps flight's crowning achievement is to put mankind into space. In July 1969, Americans Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong became the first men to land on the moon. Their achievement was the culmination of a race begun in 1957 when the Russians succeeded in putting the first man-made object into space, the Sputnik. In 1961, the Russians then put their first man into space. Yuri Gagarin. But the US Apollo program was the first to put a man on the moon. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Ignition flight. Roger. In April 1970, millions of people all over the world held their breath as Mission Control and the crew of Apollo 13 struggled to bring their stricken spacecraft back to Earth. As a testament to human effort and endeavor, it was perhaps America's finest hour. Okay, flight up. We're go flight. Looks good here. Guys, that's good flight. Okay, Econ, GNC. Looks good flight. Looks good flight. Okay, Serge. Looks fine. Two Max, two and we're go flight. Roger, please. Go for station, Capcom. Confirm and board out, flight. Roger. Staging, flight. Roger. Flight fighter trajectory confirmed staging. Roger. Flight booster then board out with way early. Okay. Flight confirmed, uh, number five engine down. Roger. Booster, you don't see any problem with that, though, do you? Uh, well, negative, not right now, flight. All the other engines are go. We've had a problem here. Say again, please. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Okay, go over. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the mains. It really looks great. Over. 
A further four missions followed, each increasing our understanding of the moon. The Apollo rockets were all designed for one flight only, which was becoming an increasingly unacceptable cost. Burn. The concept of a reusable spacecraft took hold, and in April 1981, Columbia, the first space shuttle, lifted off. And the first flight of the European Space Agency's space lab. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Roger, roll. Vehicle rolling from tail south around to 35 degree azimuth northeast. Today, our horizons have extended beyond our moon to planets within our solar system. At the moment, Manned flight to these distant horizons seems almost as impossible now as flying across the English Channel must have seemed a hundred years ago. Back then, man's horizons were limited by the technology. He knew the aeroplane would enable him to travel a little bit further, to see over the next hill or across a few more miles of ocean. But 100 years later, we can see our whole planet not only can we communicate more easily, we can see how our environment is affected by what we do back on the ground. And we don't just look downwards. New spacecraft have made it possible for us to probe and explore further into the universe. Manned flights to even the nearest planet in our solar system may still be an impossible dream, but it will happen. Just as man's dream of flight was turned into a reality, when on December the 17th, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright stepped out into the sand dunes of Kill Devil Hills and Kitty Hawk for their rendezvous with destiny.